morning. Well, happy Father's Day to you. Okay, if we can all please be seated, we'll begin. Lord, we come before you, and we have a special morning, and we ask a blessing upon it. We have Chelsea Nelson with us, Lord, and she's going to lead us in worship, and Father, we lift her up to you. All she really has to do is bring down heaven to us and bring us up to heaven. Not an incredible project, but sounds like it, but Lord, you do most of the work, and we thank you for her gifting, Lord, that you've gifted her voice, you've gifted her fingers, you've gifted her mind with a blessing, Lord, and that is to lead worship. We thank you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, well, good morning, church. Do you guys usually stand? All right, go ahead and stand on up. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, give thanks, give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever, sing praise.
Jesus, that is always our prayer, God. We always need more of your grace, Lord, and we are thankful that your grace is abundant for everything that goes on in our lives. Lord, we praise you so much that we are here getting to lift up your name this morning and be edified and built up together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Praise God. Thank you, Chelsea. We'll have more of Chelsea in a bit. Please be seated for announcements. Okay, we've got a lot this morning. You can read. How many need me to read this? Okay, I'll read it. Someone raised their hand. Okay, happy Father's Day to the fathers this morning. How many fathers do we have here this morning? All right, very good. Dan Gillen, you're not a father? Okay, because... <laughs> <laughs> no, I know his son, or I would say he just doesn't want to remember, but his son, you want to remember, he's a great guy, Matt's just a great guy, Matt, right, Matthew, yeah, he's a wonderful child, an adult man actually now, uh, crochet ministry, solid rock hospitality, if you fill out the blue connection card in the seat back in front of you, you can get something free from the solid rock if you're a visitor, otherwise we'll have everyone in the church filling those out and they won't be happy with me back there. If you'd like to contribute to our food ministry, well, we just, what we did was, okay, this is kind of put in here before the fact, and um, we are taking care of the food ministry. We had a board of elder meeting, we, elders meeting, and we increased the budget to meet the need. Yesterday, we have two days a week we feed people, Friday and Saturday. Now, yesterday, we ran out of food an hour and a half before closing. But because of the increased budget, because we were able to, to I wasn't intending to go into this, but because we were able to be blessed so much with your support and the live streamers as well for the building fund, a significant amount from live stream, and then a family in the church really blessed us gigantically, and then all, the, all of us, you know, faithful, building fund givers, 
uh, we were able to give the $20,000 on our second at the first of the month. And though it says here $2,323 in the building fund, we're going to be making another $10,000 payment July 1st. Yeah, and so, yes. God's blessing the church. What can I tell you, you know? Chuck Smith, Pastor Chuck had a philosophy. When we started this cha Calvary Chapel, we didn't get a penny. Nothing from Costa Mesa. And his philosophy has always been where God provides, God guides. I mean, where God guides, God provides. <laughs> Backwards there. And that's how it always is. And, you know, you, you do a youth center, God provides. You do a food ministry, God provides. Whatever you're doing, if, you, if, it's, by, if it's from God and, and he, he's directed you, it, it, it happens. Building fund, he's providing. And, you know, with all that happening there, now we're able to free that money up that we had intended for the fireworks stand, and we're able to take that, and we're, we're, we're going to, to use it for the food ministry. One of the problems that why we ran out of meat is because we only have one freezer. It's a big freezer, but then we only have one, so we're going to get an additional one. Uh, Karen's going, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so then we won't run out of meat because part of it hasn't been just the money. It's been also the capacity to keep the frozen food. And so it all goes together. Yesterday, we fed, in the first hour, we fed, we, 23 people came in, families, because the people represent a family. It's not like one person comes in. And we're like the only food bank, uh, Placer County Food Bank agency within like a three-mile radius. And then plus, we have others coming from other places where they were going, these are people who don't have a lot of money. They're spending money on gas and doing extra time because they get treated better here, and we have fresher food because we get it every week, and we get it out, and we go through the time and trouble and effort to go get more each week. We make our pickup. And so, you know, now we're challenged with success. That's, you know, yeah, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, but, you know, but it's challenging. Success is challenging, I'll tell you. And so that's what's going on. Uh, thank you, people. Thank you for your faithful giving and your support and these things. We, you know, if you want to help on a Friday or Saturday, uh, you feel free to. We were doing it Thursday and Friday, and then what happens? We start getting too successful, and, and then, you know, it's like we do have neighbors, and they have their businesses open for Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday, and so now Saturday they're not many open, and so it works out better on that day. Uh, and so it's a work in progress. A fireworks stand. Uh, Larry, why don't you come up right now instead of, you know, since that's the point. Larry Jones. Can we give him a little... Most of our help on uh, July the 4th, which is, you know, er everybody's partying and doing things, right? You're not available on the 4th, but if you're not, if you don't have plans and you can help out, that'd be great. Uh, we have a 2 to 6 and a 6 to 10, which I think will probably close at 9, not 10, right, Pastor Ken? Oh, it will be 10. Okay, so I'm corrected. Um, and then Friday, July 3rd, we have a 2 to 6 that we really need help on. And uh, let's see, Thursday, July 2nd, 2 to 6. And Thursday, uh, also 10 a.m. to 2, we need at least one person. Be nice. Um, now, this goes backwards, so forgive me. Whoever printed this, printed it backwards. Uh, okay, so July 1st, we need some help, which is Wednesday, 2 to 6. And two, let's see, Tuesday, June 30th, we need 2 to 6. It looks like the night time's filled, so that's good. And pretty much, that's it. So th from the 30th to the 4th is when we need the most help. So if you guys can help out, come see me, and I'll put you on the spot here. And uh, just thank you. Thank you for everything that you guys do. We appreciate all the uh, help you can help us with. Yeah, Larry has had a lot has a lot of people who said that they wanted to wait to fill in, and so he 
will be calling you, those people who are on the list of, hey, I, you know, I, I wanted to wait, but also now's the time not to wait, but to get signed up. And uh, for instance, if you want to spend time with Pastor Gene and his family, they'll be there the whole 4th of July day. And so, uh, and others too. Uh, you know, I'll, there's, uh, there's those of us that'll be out there. So praise God, Lord, we thank you uh, for everything. We have a ladies' luncheon coming up July 18th, Continental Breakfast at 9, Worship Fellowship and Guest Speakers begin at 10, lunch served at 12.30, but don't show up at 12.30. We, want God for, we thank God for each one of you, and we praise him from whom all blessings flow. Men's Breakfast next meets July 11th, 8 a.m. Be sure to sign up so that you, you'll have a phone call. All right, now we have a, before we do the tithe and offering, we have a special presentation. This morning, the Stegies came to me and they said, hey, we had this opportunity to put out a devotional, another devotional, additional do devotional on hope. And should we order these? And I said, you know, one of my things is, is to give back to you. You know, I like it, and I purposely will have calendars made up. Say, they say cal compliments of Calvary Chapel Roseville. So at the end of the year, we can offer you a calendar. Last year, we gave out 100 calendars. I'm, you know, we ordered 100 calendars. And devotionals, whatever we can give back to bless you. And so this is something we're giving to you to bless you. We ready to roll? A city on a hill. Every believer is called to make a difference in the world, to love God completely, and to make disciples of every nation. But in this busy, mobile, noisy world, it can be difficult to even do the basics, to pray, to read the Word, to bring the love of God to our marriages, families, neighbors, and co-workers. We know you're here because you want to be a part of God's mission on the earth. You want to experience the abundant life that Scripture talks about, you're looking to connect your faith to every part of your life, every day of the week. That's why our church is subscribing to Right Now Media and making it available for free to every member of our church. You'll have access to over 10,000 online Bible study videos on parenting, marriage, finance, discipleship, leadership, and many more. The videos can be used in Bible study groups or for personal devotion. There's also a huge library of safe biblical kids' videos. We'd love to see every member of our church utilizing Right Now Media. Small group leaders leading their adult or youth groups through engaging Bible study series. Children enjoying safe programming that doesn't just entertain, but helps lay a strong spiritual foundation. Families spending quality time together, going through devotional Bible studies. Couples using biblical studies on marriage, parenting, and finance applying God's Word to every area of their lives. There is something for everyone. We want to help you grow as a disciple of Christ, and we want to help you become a disciple maker in your home, your school, your workplace, your neighborhood, in whatever mission field God has called you to. We believe that this free resource will help equip and unleash you to live out your faith in every area of life, to experience God-centered, abundant life, not just on Sundays, but every day. We are for you, and God is for you. He wants to empower you every day to live for Him. Together, we can be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill. Okay, this is being made available to you for free. We have these little deals here, but we also have a sign-up sheet we have a lot of emails already, but if you give us your email, what will happen is I will program the email personally into the site, and then you'll get an invitation, it'll say from me, to look at the site and get a password. And then it's free. You can go on whenever you want. Right now, there's a, a, an incredible series going on, an eight-part series, um, The Grace-Filled Marriage. And it's a marriage seminar. That's what it is. But you can watch that marriage, marriage seminar from the comfort and convenience of your home. You can watch the Financial Institute Principles by Dave Ramsey from your home. If you need some parenting skills or, or some parenting you know, 
training and whatnot because your kids are wild. You can sit with them and you can watch a parenting class. And so all these different things. There's like 1,500 veggie tales and what does the Bible say? How many of you are familiar with or watch what does the Bible say? Okay. Well, it's mostly the kids that watch it. But the parents pay for it. And so now it's free. You go on and, and you know, there's 1,500 to choose from. And so um, we're, all, we're giving this to you for free. And so also there's like Francis Chan studies. There's um, just, it goes on and on. Char uh, Andy Stanley, as you saw, uh, it just forever. There's college and singles. You, you, it, and it's set up like Netflix. So all you have to do is you hit a box that, that says college and singles. And then there's like maybe a dozen college and singles Christian videos that you can watch on being a college person or being a single person. And so what it does is it saves a lot of, of, of time from having to try to wait until something is in the, in the community, a marriage seminar, a parenting seminar, or if there isn't a college and singles group that you go to, all these different things. And so um, we have a sign-up sheet. If you put your email, like I say, I'll personally be the one putting the emails in. So no one's going to get your email. There's no... It's not like, you know, we've had some problems with organizations coming in and they get a hold of your email. Next thing you know, everyone's being solicited every month. Well, there's no solicitation because you don't pay for this. It's 100% free. It's zero, okay? And so it's an incredible um, resource for you to access. Last week, we, we passed out Calvary Distinctives. We had a dozen. They went very quickly. And uh, Ray Dawson said that uh, there, were people, there were quite a few more people who wanted them. And so, Ray Dawson, are you there? Okay. If you raise your hand, we'll get the distinctive books to you. Okay, here's, here's a, okay the hands are up. Meanwhile, we're going to pray for the tithe and offering. Lord, we give thanks for the tithe and offering. We have your blessing upon it. And Father, we just thank you for the for what you're doing, how you just fund and you bless and you provide. You guide us, and, and the next thing you know, something we thought was going to be a little program is mushroomed into something big and a major blessing. And we have people here this morning who, who um, were blessed and now are here with us. And Lord God, we thank you for, for this blessing. We pray in your name, Jesus, that we would look forward to more and more and more blessing. In your name, Jesus, we pray this. And everyone said, amen. Oops, wrong check. I have to do it later. They don't like it when I put in a check to someone else or I put in a blank check. They come back, oh, man, are we supposed to fill this out? Okay, we're going to have to skip reading time. Chelsea?
awestruck wonder at the mansion of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was
see. All right, there we go. Thank you, Sissy. I never would have known. I would have been up here for like, you know, 10 minutes and then Sissy be waving. No mic, no recording, no live stream, no nothing. Lord, we come and it's Father's Day and we thank you. Father, happy Father's Day to the greatest father of all, to the first father, to the one that makes all other fathers and mothers, and people, the creator of the human race, the one who set up the family system, father, son, mother, daughter, father, daughter, mother, and children, the, what we call the nuclear family, the, the family unit. We give thanks for that, Lord, and we, we just ask a blessing upon it, Lord, this day as we come and we, with reverence and sincerity and seriousness, we, we look and we give thanks to our Father, Happy Father's Day, but we also reflect on 
what it means to be a father, Lord. And we want to hold the standard. We want to support men in that role, Lord, of fatherhood. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And we can all say, amen. We're going to be in Exodus 20 as well as other verses. Exodus is pretty easy to find. There was a young boy who asked the question, what is the difference between Father's Day and Mother's Day? It's a valid question. Or he was asked the question. Actually, the young boy was asked the question, what is the difference between Father's Day and Mother's Day? And the young boy thought for a second, and he said, well, the difference is that on Mother's Day, you spend a lot more in the present. And you know what? I don't know about your family, but it pretty much works that way in my family. In our family, Leslie's homesick with that cough that's going around that people describe as having the worst smoker's cough on earth. But I'm sure she would agree with me. Mother's Day is the number one day for restaurant dinners. Number one, the, the people that go out to dinner, dinner on Mother's Day far excel any other day. The second day is Valentine's Day. And then the third day is Father's Day. But there's something, you know, about mom. And, but the part of it is, too, that, that the gals, they, you know, they, they respond more to the gifts they respond more to going out to dinner. And us guys, sometimes it's like, you know, we give a rose, right? And someone said to me, well, what do we have for the fathers that we're going to give them on, on Sunday? I said, they don't care. They're not going to miss it. Any, was there any, any father here who came in this morning who said, oh, how come we didn't get? There was? Not a rose. <laughs> That's a good one, Dad. Not the rose, but like, you know, a bookmarker or... You know, and, and it's just kind of a waste because we give you the bookmarkers and then, you know, you, you don't even, like me, I get a bookmarker. I, I, I don't even read books. I, I read the iPad books. And, and so, you know, I, I read a lot and I read a lot of books, but I don't read them where I have to put a marker. I just hit a little button that turns a red flag on and it marks the page I was in on the screen. It's just the way things are now, changing world. And I, you know what? I almost didn't do a Father's Day message. I almost said, you know what? They, probably no one will even notice. And I'll just move on and with John chapter, uh, chapter 9 and, and get into that and, and we'll dig in and, and, you know. And then I said, that's what we'll do. But then what happens? My good friend, Bob Gold, our good friend, Bob Gold, director of Crisis Pregnancy Center, sends me an email. And he says, I'm resigning, I'm leaving the Alternative Pregnancy Center. He's the director of the local one. And I'm moving on to Shoulders to Shoulders Ministry. And that's all about ministering to young men, especially young urban men. It's a ministry committed to breaking the vicious cycle of fatherlessness in the Sacramento area. It's a major problem, not just here. It's a major problem in every city. And even in uh, towns, bigger in the city, though. And now he's committing himself to work on another sin that brings abortions into the picture. Because when there isn't a father, a lot of times, then there's more temptation to abort. Fatherless families. A ministry to help train up urban fathers to fulfill their God-given role in the family. And no matter where you get your statistics, if you go to Christian statistics, man, they are really, really bad as far as the effects of not having a father in the family unit. But sometimes, you know, Christian statistics, we tend to sometimes get evangelistically speaking. You know, oh yeah, 100 people got saved. Well, really? Well, you know, but we do that. And so I went to the government statistics, and you know what? They weren't, they were like, you know, they weren't as bad, but they were bad also of, of what happens when there's no father. Now, of course, for the Christian, when we don't have a father, we, we pull in the father into that 
situation. And we know that we're God guides. If God guides you to be a parent, if God guides you to take care of your kids, whether there's not a mother, maybe a car accident happens or whatever, or a father, or both, God will take care of it. God will provide. But the way he originally made it was that there be a mother and a father in your life growing up. And so these holidays, Father's Day, Mother's Day, they're bittersweet for many. Because, you know, it's so great to say Happy Father's Day when there's a good father in the picture. But when you didn't have a good father, and many people didn't have a good father, and instead you had quite the opposite. You had a failure for a father. Well, then it's hard to to say, yeah, I want to get right on the phone and call my dad up and tell him, man, Happy Father's Day, Dad. And, I, you know, all that stuff you did to me, the stuff that you didn't do for me that you should have, well, you know, that, that's all, you know, that just, you know, messed me up for life. But, you know, that, I, I forgive you. And, and it's hard. It's difficult. Now, each year in this country, the number of fatherless homes grows. It grows. It doesn't decline. And it's sad. And the percentages are getting so high that now there's like more than 50% of the homes, no matter what statistics you look at, don't have a father. Homes with the children. And so I was tempted, and I started on one message last week, and and then I scrapped that one, and I started on another one, and I scrapped that one last night, early evening, not, you know, late before I went to bed, but early enough, like like five o'clock in the evening, and started a whole new message. Stayed up late, got up at 5.30 to, to work on it some more, and, and I, I'm somewhat settled in this message. I'm, I'm happy with it. I really believe that God spoke, and it's a good message that will be relative, because I didn't want to have a message where, you know, when the congregation is full of young men, well, then they're all parenting the kid. Or women, what about, you know, I mean, you know, should they stay home for the Father's Day message? No, I want to make it something that everyone can draw from. Everyone can, can be ministered to by it. And that's important. Now, shoulder to shoulder has their commitment to share the Lord's plan and by the saving grace of Jesus Christ to take these guys who are negligent in their responsibility. And now what's happening is we have a society that really doesn't put much pressure on them, except financial. Our society is doing really well now about going after deadbeat fathers. You know, you can't get a license, a car license, uh, you know, all kinds of things, repercussions if you are in arrears on child support. And these are, you know, things that for years the poor wife suffered and, and didn't have money to bring up the kids while the guy is, you know, out there on his yacht and driving his, his Lamborghini. And so there, there was a need. You know, that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. And so there was a need for this, and that's good, that kind of accountability. But there's another accountability. And it's not just to write a check every month, but it's to be a father, to be a godly father, to be a good role model, to be a good example for your children. It's important. And God gave Moses ten commandments, and only ten, up there on Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. These are all things towards God. These are the four commandments, the first four. They're about our relationship with the, with the Father, with God, and how we're to treat God. Don't make graven images. Love God. And then there's number five. Honor thy father and thy mother. And this begins the six commandments that are about people, our relationship to people, how we should act towards each other. And it's interesting, not to the Jewish mind, but to our mind, that God would start off with honor your father and mother. You see, to the Jew, this was a no-brainer. Your parents came first. Your parents were very important. And in fact, just for disobedience, you could be stoned to death. You could be killed because you disobeyed your parents. And they, 
and kids were. They disobeyed, they didn't listen, and they kept doing it. Sometimes they'd be stoned to death. Now, you know, I don't condone that. That was Old Testament, and I'm glad it, I think it should be an Old Testament. But in some parts of the country where you find the Taliban and whatnot, they could be still doing this stuff. But, you know, there are other ways than killing a child for disobedient, dis, being disobedient. Amen? I mean, you know, come on, be a little creative. Take away their iPad. Take away their cell phone. Take away the car keys. You know, that's, for them, that's worse than stoning them to death. My kids laugh with us, and they talk about how many times they were put on restriction. They remember, you know, they said, man, we were always on restriction. And so the, the fifth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother. And then it, the next one is you shall not kill murder, but honor thy father and mother comes before killing. You shall not commit adultery. Honor thy father and mother comes before adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And so the first four commandments deal with how to treat God. The last six, how to treat people. And the first of the six about parents, honoring your parents. Very, very important. Now, before not stealing, more fundamental than not committing adultery in the marriage, in the family, that's a disaster. But superseding, murdering, God starts the list on how to treat others with honor your father and mother. Why? Because this is a foundation for godliness, for a godly family. It's a foundation for society's health and well-being. It's a foundation that keeps civilization moving in a progressive manner instead of civilization moving in a declining manner. It is so important. It is called the nuclear family. Now, the Jews saw parents as their first responsibility, and that included supplying for the parents when they were elderly. Now it's, well, you know, put them in the, the home, the retirement home, or the nursing home, or whatever. But back then, they didn't have nursing homes. The, you know, you were born in that house, and you died in that house, and you took care of your kids, you raised your kids, you provided for them, and then when you needed the diapers, the kids were there for you. When they needed the diapers, you you did that, and then when you needed them, they did it. And that's the way it worked. And it had worked that way up until maybe the last 60 years or whatever, 40 years, it worked that way. And then it all changed. Now, Colossians chapter 3, verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, there's a twofold, there's a two-edged sword here. The sin goes back and forth. You see, there's the sin of children obey your parents. And for most of us, we're beyond that, obeying our parents. That it may go well for you, that you may have a long life, by the way. But there's also the sin of a father who doesn't discipline his children, doesn't have the structure in his family where this takes place, where the children are obedient. And there's a lot of men who are failures as fathers. And then people grow up with a failure as a father, and they grow up lawless, without discipline. They are not obedient, and it causes society major problems, and it causes that person problems because they didn't have the model that they should have had. And they end up with a lot of problems throughout their life. They have problems at work. They have problems... In the family, they have problems everywhere. And the fifth commandment means that we show all honor, love, and faithfulness to our father and mother. And fathers and mothers, we honor you this day. But as Colossians continues in the first chapter, I mean in chapter 3, it goes on to show why we need to learn to obey our parents. It's a model for the rest of our lives. And when parents don't do their job, and they say, oh, well, the pastor will do it, or the Sunday school teachers will do it, or the teachers at school will do it. Those 
parents become failures because it's not for the Sunday school teachers. It's not for me. And God knows it certainly isn't for the public school teachers. God knows that. It's for the Christian parent. It's for the Christian grandparent to make sure that those kids grow up honoring and obedience, discipline. And you see, children's honoring the father and mother is the starting point <clears throat> to obedience to the other authorities God's going to put in their lives, throughout their lives. And when they don't have, when they have a failure for a father, when they, are, when they grow within a failed family unit, it doesn't work the way God intended it to be. An unruly child is likely to turn into a rebellious, unruly adult. A person who has problems with authority figures as a child usually carries that liability into their adulthood. It's just how it works. Next week, we're going to be looking at, in John chapter 9, generational sin. Sin being passed down from one generation to another. Now, it doesn't always, we're going to get into that, and it's not like that's how it always works. A lot of, most of the sin isn't, you can't say, oh, my father, my mother. But a lot of it, you can. We can see it. We can see it statistically. Someone who has problems with authority figures as a child usually carries that liability into their adult lives, and they end up struggling at work, at home, in church, in the club they belong to, and in their marriage, etc. And there can be no doubt that the fifth commandment extends into the New Testament, and let there be no doubt as well that the fifth commandment extends beyond our childhood years. And that's why it's so important for fathers to be fathers. You see, siring a child doesn't make you a father. Anybody can do that. And they do. And they have five or six children. But what really makes you a father is when you're there for those children, when you set up a godly structure in the home. Now, when we talk about mothers, we talk about mothers, but this Sunday we're talking about fathers. You know, that's why we go through the Word of God, too, is because we hit it, hit it in Colossians, hit it in Ephesians. And let's look at how this plays out in God's plan, this honoring father and mother as a foundation of life that brings freedom and the importance of a father who establishes this in his family. The first part of this verse is a command for every child, of course, to obey and honor his or her earthly parents. And in Exodus, the English word, I mean, the, the Hebrew word behind the English word, the English word is actually like weightiness. It's the, it's the meaning of the Hebrew word, this has, this honor has a, a weightiness. And see, I'm old school. When I go buy something, whether it be a calculator or anything else, one of the first things I do, and now, you know, this is like old school, and now it's not correct. It doesn't really work all the time. But the, one of the first things I do is I say, and I judge the quality a lot of times by the weight. Now, you know, in this day and age, if it's, if it's like some kind of super fiber, this microphone can cost $1,000 because it's made out of this light, superweight fiber. A bicycle, in the old days, I would lift my, a bike up when I went to buy a bicycle, and I'd say, oh, yeah, this is hefty, this is strong. But nowadays, you pay $5,000 for a bicycle because you can lift it up with your pinky because it's so light, but it's still strong. And so, you know, the old way doesn't work but for most, for, uh, as much as it once did. But the weightiness... And now, of course, some manufacturers put weights inside their products, just, you know, sand or whatever, to make it feel heavier. But we are to give weight to our parents. We might say it like this. You should give your parents a ton of respect. And you should demand a ton of respect from your children. And, of course, I always talk about the three C's, clarity. You should make it clear that this is the Bible. This is God's way, and that is to honor, to respect your parents, and, but you should also do it consistently, not just you know, call them out when they do something wrong 
one time, but then let them get away with it over and over again, and then finally say, I've told you 20 times, now you're on restriction. No, there should be consistency, and then there should be compassion. You know, after it's all done, hey, you know, you're, you're sorry, okay, I, I hug and love, and I love you, and I love you too much to, to not do it God's way in your life. I don't want to see you as an adult failure. I don't want to see you, you know, not getting into college because you didn't have the discipline and you went out and did one thing in one night that kept you from ever getting into the best colleges. Because now you have a police record. You can't become a police officer because of it. You can't become many things that need security clearance because you did this one thing that one night. And that's why it's so important that parents don't become their child's best friend at the expense of being their parent. You know, children don't come out of the womb or even in the womb honoring their parents and respecting their parents. What do they do in the womb? They kick the mother. That's what they do. Esau and Jacob, what were they doing? They were warring in the womb. The Bible says two separate nations in her womb, warring with each other. And then they came out and they warred even more. But, but sin right there in the womb. Next week, we're, we're going to be looking at this generational thing and how the rabbis took the different scriptures about activity in the womb and, and said, yeah, okay, well, we're sinners right from the, in the womb. And this is the duty of every child and every parent under the authority of God. Now, of course, some parents were failures, and that thwarts God's plan big time, and it makes it hard to deal with. Some parents were abusive. Some tried to make the kids the best friend instead of the parent. And that wasn't like perceived as abusive, but it was still a failure. And that's why it's so important to set up the boundaries, to set it up God's way. Scripture doesn't say to be their best friend. Rather, Scripture teaches us that we're born in sin and our sin will be automatic. You know, we don't have to, like, work at sinning. You know, we're rebels. We're sinners. We kick mom in the belly early on. And then we get out and we do all kinds of stuff. And then we need someone to tell us, no, that's wrong. You know, my, my, one of my granddaughters, she, with, she's with the other grandkids, and she's always grabbing their stuff. And she's kind of a strong kid, and, and you know, st just strong, that's period. And we have to keep constantly saying, no, don't do that. Give it back. No, I don't want to give it back. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other kids are, are not quite as aggressive, and they're, oh, they, my toy's gone. You know, I was playing with that, and you have to deal with it. And is it fun? No. I want to be the grandparent. I don't want to deal with that stuff. But they're over our house and the parents aren't there. When my daughters are there, they deal with it quickly. But parents are given by God to children to serve as his instructor, as his authority with those children. They're, you're stewarding God's children you know, you think they're yours because you sired them, you carried them for nine months, but they're actually God's children that you have charge over for a time while you're on earth. And you're to establish during that time his authority, and you're to establish that they're to honor you and your wife or, or, or you and your husband, and that foundation prepares their little hearts to honor God. Augustine once, once asked a rhetorical question. If anyone, fails, if anyone fails to honor his parents, is there anyone he will spare? So in the home, children are under the authority of the parents, and children are to honor that God-ordained authority. And it's the parent's job to establish that. But the truth will always be that we live under some kind of authority all the days of our life. That's how God made it. And it reminds me of the, young, of the story of the young man who said that I've had enough of, of my parents' rules. He wanted his freedom. And so he decided, I'm out of here. I'm out of this house. And someone asked, well, 
where are you going to go? You don't have a job. You don't have any money. Your friends aren't going to let you stay with them for long, for free. Where are you going? I'm joining the Marines. You're joining the Marines. Good luck with that. You think you're leaving? Maybe you should join the Air Force. No. Air Force would be the same deal. Army, Navy, same deal. You think you don't like it at home because you don't want rules? And you're going to join the military? You know, I've got to say that some of the best people throughout the decades that I've been pastoring, some of the best members of the church congregates are military families. They just really are. And it's because the, the military makes men. The military makes fathers. The military makes responsibility happen in a life. And we're never going to escape the authority in our authorities in our lives. And the truth is that, yes, we, many of us can testify to an abusive parent, whether that be father, mother, or both, to a failure. And we can, you know, have been affected by that terribly, damaged by it. But the buck stops. You know, sooner or later, you got to move on. you got to say, okay, that was that, but now you know, I'm going to be different than that. Romans 13, 1, we're under the authority of the government. The Bible says to submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. But why do we Christians, like, you know, a lot of times we're, we're not very big on, oh, yeah, the government. I'm to submit to the government. I'm to pay my taxes without, you know, I mean, you're, we're allowed to complain. You know, we're Americans, but, but why is it that, you know, we, we have this thing, oh, you know, the government and this and that. Now, when I was young, it, it got extended to, well, we really, we could break the laws because, you know, if I go over to this country, the law is different than it is here, and so the American law, you know, I'm not going to be under the, the rule of an American law. I'm under the rule of the French laws, or I'm under the rule of the Dutch laws. Those are the ones I choose to be under. And I didn't have the Bible, but the Bible says... When we go to work, we're under the authority of our employers. Now, some people, you know, what they, they never have a job because they just don't work out. They go and they, they, can't, they can't even do a job. In fact, someone recently this week told me something that a manager told them to do something. Randy will appreciate this. And they said to the manager, no, you do it. And they got fired on the spot. Hello? <laughs> and sometimes we Christians don't get it. You know, I know a lot of business people, and unfortunately, I hate to say this, I really do, but business people, business owners tell me that some of the worst employees and the people they won't hire are, guess who? Christians. And that's sad. It should be the opposite. It should be, yeah, pastor, how many Christians do you have who I can hire? Not, pastor, you're trying to, to get me to hire somebody, and you know what? The experience has just been bad. They don't want to work. They want to talk about Jesus. But on my dollar, on company time, when I need things to get done, they want to, oh, I'm witnessing. They don't tend to be real hard workers, I'm told. You know, even though I know that this church is full of hard workers. But then again, you know, we're a family that is under God's authority. You know, we believe in the word of God. We believe that, that we're to go out there and give our all to our job and to our employer. Not that we don't take care of our family, we don't have fun and whatnot, but when we go on that clock, you know, we're to, 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 to not cheat. You know, it's, it's not like, you know, <laughs> like that one gal who got fired a few years ago and she complained, yeah, they fired me because, you know, I, I don't come in on time. You know, how could they do that? The Bible says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does. Hebrews 13, 7. 
Obey your leaders. Submit to their authority. There's a great lesson to be learned from the fifth commandment. When a child learns to submit to mom and dad, when that's established in the family, that biblical order, it lays a foundation for their living under the authority as a citizen, as an employee, as a member of society. And then you have some people say, well, you know, I'm just an unruly person. Well, you know what? That, what you're really saying is I'm a sinner, and pretty much that means unrepentant sinner. Or like, I'm Irish, that's why I, I fly off at the handle. You know, the, us Irish, we all have tempers. That's why we yell and scream. But most important of all, learning to live with your parents is preparation for submitting to the ultimate authority who is Christ Jesus. Colossians 2, verses 9 through 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now, another translation reads, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. The Lord Jesus Christ is the final authority in the universe, and every person must bow before him in submission. That's the word of God. That's where we read through the word of God, and we don't say, well, this is for me, and this isn't. That's where we say, happy Father's Day, Father. And I think it's accurate to say the single most important evangelistic influence in a child's life is, is that growing up in the family. You know, you, you, you let a little rebel grow up and they're going to be a rebel when they leave. Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see, I talk about the three C's. And you anger a child when you don't discipline them consistently with clarity, and then you pull it on them. You know, you're not doing it. You're not a man, a father, who's doing it the way God wants you to. And then next thing you know, you know, the child's angry because you come and you say, well, man, you burned the house down, now I'm mad. I told you not to play with matches 20 times. Well, then the child, well, you know, well, you did, but you never stopped me. You never took the matches away. You never did that part. And then there's the compassion part. And, you know, it's not so that you rule the house and you've got these little slaves for, that are called kids. I know the Bible says slaves, be, be a slave in that work situation. But, you know, it left room for that Roman master to treat his, his slaves as, as, as his family. And I would hope that back in that day, if there was a Christian Roman master, that's what they did. And so it's not like, you know, this is, okay, kids, you know, go clean out the, the stall. Go, you know, do this, do that. No. It's, there needs to be that love. There needs to be that you know, respect. And on Father's Days, it's, it's important to, to look at this and to be the model, but we want to be a Christ-like model, not Hitler. You know, I mean, so many people, I hear them say, my father was a Hitler. That's not good either. That's just, you know, another bummer that is a failure of a father who ends up with kids who are failures. Most of the time, fathers, I want to say a father feels inadequate. When I was raising my kids, I felt inadequate. But then I knew what I stood on was the word of God. The word of God is that if God gave me children, he guided me and he'd provide for me to be a father if I call upon him, if I ask for his help. And he did. And I was never perfect. I look back and I have regrets of things, things, the way I raised the kids in some respects, but you know what? I've got two wonderful girls. They both love God. And they're raising wonderful kids with discipline and order. 
And I, I would hope they do a better job than I did. That's my hope. I really do. You know, I hope that they would take what I did and amplify it. Crank it up. Do it better. Because that's, that was part of the, that's part of the purpose. But it doesn't mean that we don't have, you know, what we could have done. And Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father mother, and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live, lo live long in the land. That's the promise. Obeying the command is a pathway to blessings. It's a terrible sin to talk back to your parents, to raise your voice at your parents, to cuss your parents out, to disobey them. And it's a terrible sin for a parent to allow it. And the Word of God says it will not go well with you if you live like that, either the kids or the father or mother. And I think back to my teenage years, and man, I'm lucky God didn't send a lightning bolt and strike me dead. That was grace totally, because, you know, I wasn't the best of a kid. I didn't know it, though, at the time. I thought I was the greatest kid on earth. But I wasn't. And a lot of times, Christians, we think we're, all, we're the greatest Christian on earth. But we're not. Mother Teresa was that. She's gone. And that'll, you know, everybody will say, oh, she was Catholic, or she saved even. Just, a, just a, a, a little illustration, a little, you know. She did get the Nobel Peace Prize, after all. And you see, living in obedience to God brings freedom. A freedom that not only extends to the children when they're young, but to the children when they're old. And who are the children who are now old? Us. Us. It brings a freedom. Because whenever you obey God's truth, the truth will, will make you free. It'll make you free. You see, without obedience to the fifth commandment, the screaming young, young toddler quickly becomes the rebellious teenager who slowly becomes the empty young adult who finally becomes the bitter and lonely senior citizen. In contrast to such an enslaved, hopeless life, believers can choose to love the fifth commandment and find grace in it. And it's being lost out there, parents. It's being lost out there, grandparents. It's being lost out there, children, because there's another brainwashing going on by Hollywood. There are so many levels of brainwashing going on. And one is they depict the father as what? Huh? Stupid. What else? Unnecessary. Irresponsible. And some fathers are, but not across the board like they depict. The father's like this, you know, nerdy, not even, not nerd's a good word. This, you know, he's a jerk. Something to be laughed at. And Jesus left us with the classic example of a child living in rebellion. Now, didn't he? In, the, in rebellion to the fifth commandment in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. If you remember, that young man was so rebellious and so selfish and didn't want to play by the father's rules that he asked for his inheritance before his father died. And it was another way of saying, I wish you were dead so I could have my dough right now, my inheritance, so I can have your money. So the father gave the young man his inheritance, his share. And the, man took, the young man took it off into a foreign country and partied hardy until every penny was what? Gone. And then what happened? Yeah, he, had, he rode a high horse for quite a while and partied and had tons of friends. Penniless, he had no friends. Everyone abandoned him. And he was forced to do hard labor. And he wished that he had the same food that his father fed his pigs. Because obviously the kid didn't have food or good food. But what does he do? 
He says, I'm going to have to go back on my knees to my father, and if he'll just give me a job like one of the servants, that'll be fine. At least it'll be better than I am in this foreign land. And he resigns himself to that, the young man does, the sinful young man. And he goes back expecting to, to be treated no better than a servant in his father's household. Because after all, what did, after he had rebelled after what he had done. But what happens? His father sees him in the distance coming, and he runs to his son, embraces him, puts a coat around him, puts a ring of authority on his finger, calls for a, a, a fattened calf to be slaughtered, and makes a great banquet feast to celebrate his return. Now, the prodigal had to learn the hard way. And so often, when a parent doesn't do the job, when the kid isn't equipped in the ways of the Lord, they have to go out and they learn it the hard way. The prisons, the statistics tell us, are full of those men and women. Statistically, kids that weren't raised with the discipline, with the family structure, are the ones that are in prison. Sin always leads to slavery, and perhaps no sin illustrates that more than the sin of dishonoring your father and mother or not raising your kids in the way of the Lord. And true faith, freedom can be found in repenting of sin, submitting to Christ, and then returning back to God's law to learn to live with honor for father and mother, as the prodigal did. You see, the prodigal repented. The prodigal was so glad when that father opened his heart. And the word of God is, is that the more we obey, the freer we become. You see, in a world which the fifth commandment is honored, everything would be different. Your home would be different. There wouldn't be that toddler screaming in the grocery store uncontrolled. You like that shrie that sh that you know shrieking and oh man you're in line or someplace else and oh yeah man there's is that child singing? <laughs> Parents not saying anything. It must be a song. There'd be no so senior citizen lying lonely in some home with no one visiting. The church would be a demonstration of, of honor and, and that would attract people. Gene and I were talking, Pastor Gene and I were talking about that yesterday, about how, how some of the things that happen, you know, that the way we, we say, oh yeah, well, you know, if, if, if you can go do that with, with sinners or, or be there with the sinners, but if it were church people, then you'd have to judge them because Christ said, judge, the th judge those in the church, don't judge those in the world. Well, then if I were not a Christian and I were a sinner, I'd say, well, why do I want to be in the church? I can just be in the world. And then I don't get judged. Why would I want to go join that bunch in that club where then they're going to start judging me for what I'm doing? We were just going through all the different angles. But there's Jesus. The conclusion, you keep the fifth commandment. It's the heart of our ability to evangelize Sacramento with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you always kept the fifth commandment? Have you never talked back or slandered, disobeyed, or dishonored your father or mother, your boss at work? Have you never shown disrespect? Well, the truth is we've all fallen short of that commandment, and we deserve death. Deuteronomy 21, where the young man was put to death for disobeying his parents. But then, of course, there's Jesus. And people often wondered why the Bible is so silent about his childhood. What does it tell us about Jesus' childhood? Very little. Very little. Now, the rabbis had stories that Jesus would make clay, pig clay doves, and he'd read this. I've heard this story numerous times, and that the the, the clay pigeon would turn in, into a live pigeon, a dove would turn into a live dove and fly away. It's a nice story. Uh, it could be true. I don't know, but you know, there's no. It's not in the Bible. But in Luke chapter two, Jesus is left behind in the temple, and when his parents find him and take him back home, verse fifty-one says of Jesus, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient. Some translations say submissive to his parents. 
that we're not a people that it comes naturally to. Our children aren't people who it comes naturally to. What was Jesus doing as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult? Was he making clay pigeons to fly? I think probably not, but he was filling the fifth commandment, honoring his father and his mother. And his father and his mother didn't just say, oh, Jesus is in the temple, you know, we'll go home and Jesus will find his way home. Maybe it'll be midnight or one in the morning. His imperfect and sinful father and mother, they cared about him enough to make sure that they found out what he was up to and got him on the way home. And Jesus was obedient, not just to his earthly parents, but most of all, who was he obedient to? The Father on the cross, thy will be done. And I ask you this morning, in your own life, have you been obedient unto crucifixion? Oh, you know, this is my personality. I just do what I want to do, or, you know, nobody tells me what to do. Well, that's my sin, and no one can talk to me about my sin because I'm going to keep sinning as long as I want. Or, you know, oh, well, you don't know my, my mother or father. Well, the Word says that Jesus was obedient unto crucifixion. Do you want to be like the Father? Well, it was the Father that gave the Son to be crucified. Amen? That's how much the Father believed in the order, the discipline, that he said, these people who I've created, I'm responsible for. They're messing up, and I'm, they're my responsibility because I'm their Father. And i got to provide a real sacrifice. I have to provide justice for their sin, their filth, their dysfunction, their rebellion, and I'm going to give my son. And he died that we might have the opportunity to be returning prodigals. And so this morning, happy Father's Day. You do have the model. We always have the model. The model is in the Word of God. Believing all of it. Not picking and choosing. Not saying, oh, well, you know, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. But I'll do this or I'll do that because I like doing this doing it all to the best of our ability because that's where God guides is through his word, through the good news. And if he's guided you to a certain position in life, well, he's provided that you can fulfill that position in a godly manner. And if you don't, that's on you, not him. Lord, we come to you and we say happy Father's Day, Lord, and Father God, I pray for the fathers here, especially those with with young children and those also, though, with adult children. Because I know, and the mothers, Lord, because I know personally that we have people who are still struggling big time with their adult kids or their grandkids. And it's a gigantic struggle. And sometimes they're enablers. They're, they're, They're just not doing the part. And they're letting the kids have a free ride or letting the kids curse them out. Or, I mean, I hear all kinds of things. Young kids, adult kids. And Lord, I come and pray this morning and we lift them up. And Lord, if that person wants to change, well, Lord, let them lift up their heart to you and be changed. Father God, and Father, if we're that parent that's abusive and we're We're just not, uh, uh, neglect is abuse, where we're neglecting our kids, not pouring into them. Whether our kid be 12 years old or 30 years old, Lord, we need to make some kind of investment. They're always going to be our kids. And we we need to, if they're married and whatnot, they've got their own family, and we can't boss them around, but we certainly aren't left off the hook of, of being able to say, hey, you know, you're in a bad place. Wake up. Get right. How can I help? Let's pray. I love you. Let's take this to the Father. Not me, but the Father. So, Lord, we come before the Father this day. And we ask, Lord, that we would be the standard, that we would be the people that, as the world around us comes crashing down, and, and it's the end times for sure as far as the, what's going on, 
And as the family keeps getting blown up and disintegrated, Lord, that we would be those that would proclaim the truth. And, Father, for shoulder-to-shoulder ministries, that all these young men, hundreds of thousands of them who are not meeting their responsibility as a father to their children, that they would wake up, that they'd be called, and that there would be those who would come alongside of them and help them as shoulder-to-shoulder is doing, help to breathe life into fatherhood so that because so often these men are overwhelmed and they need mentors and that we would be mentors too, Lord, to our, our families and our friends and neighbors. We pray this, that a mighty work might be done and that we can see an influence upon our society. We pray and thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you need prayer, because sometimes a message like this kind of opens up the hearts and gets the surgery gets taken place, but then the heart doesn't get closed up quite. And so if you're struggling, come on up. I'll pray with you. Pray with someone you came with. Pray to God, the Father, yourself. But take care of business. Have a good Father's Day.